Hi, my name is Manish Gupta, and in this video, I'm going to talk about QLoRa, which is about efficient fine tuning of quantized large language models. So let's get started. And I'll start this video with a, a little basics about four interesting concepts, quantization and LoRa and two others on the next slide. Okay. So first let's talk about quantization. Quantization is a very popular model compression method. It is about reducing the number of bits to store those weights. So rather than storing 32 bit weights, can you actually store uh, to, an, to a crazy you know, extreme just one bit weights, right? But typically one bit weights don't give you very good accuracy. So therefore people try to explore something between one and 32. Specifically, if you were storing eight bit weights, this is how it works. So quantizing a 32 bit floating point number, we'll call it FP32 into a int eight tensor, uh, would uh, you know uh, would uh, basically capture a range from minus 127 to 127 and uh, this is how you would perform quantization you take the number uh, you know um, basically uh, take the absolute maximum in a tensor so let's say the input tensor is x and it is in floating point 32 kind of format so you take the absolute max value and essentially you uh, round off uh, using 127 divided by absolute max of x uh, uh, x in fp32 format as the quantization constant so you can call this as constant c uh, which is basically in floating point 32 format um, and that's basically the way you quantize your numbers to 8-bit format now uh, as, as i noted here c is essentially called as a quantization content constant and then if you want to basically get back a floating point 32-bit number back from this quantized 8-bit value you would basically use this dequant function which is basically about taking your 8-bit quantized x and then dividing it by the quantization constant c, 32-bit quantization constant c. Okay. So now, um, well, uh, this basically gets into a problem. So the problem occurs given the uh, input tensor x, if you have some values in this tensor which are on extremes, let's say basically outlier values, then your max can get impacted a lot and therefore your some of the, your quantization bins are not utilized well which basically leads to a huge quantization error right so uh, one of the solutions is basically to do blockwise qubit qubit quantization so the idea is that uh, when you have an input vector, input tensor x well you chunk this input tensor x into different contiguous blocks and then independently quantize them so the hope is that you know that particular outlier guy will just belong to one of those blocks and then screw up the quantization for that block but then every other block in the input tensor x is going to be quantized with a pretty good accuracy yeah however there's a little bit of a drawback here the drawback being you know if you were to basically apply the same quantization constant c for the entire input tensor x you need to store only one 32 bit number one quantization constant so that you can dequant later right but if you are basically doing it in multiple blocks you have to remember that you have to store a quantization constant c per block uh, which can sometimes be pretty expensive okay we'll talk more about that later but that's the basics of uh, quantization now let's talk about lora so what is lora in one of the previous videos i already talked in detail about lora lora is low rank adapters uh, the idea is uh, to reuse memory requirements while training large language models um, so it basically means that you can split the weight update uh, uh, while doing backpropagation in two parts. You can have one part as pretend weights and the other part is the diff weights. So the different different weights and uh, those different weights are basically what are trained using LoRa, while the original pretend model is 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 kept constant. So essentially, if you have to basically get the outputs, you can actually get the outputs of a trained, you know, LoRa trained uh, model as a pre-trained weights W multiplied by X uh, plus this uh, X multiplied by a separate path using adapters L1 into L2, right? So, so here S basically is a constant which uh, es essentially indicates how much importance you give um, to your uh, to your uh, adapter weights L1, L2 compared to your pre-trained weights W. So pre-trained weights W are not updated, right? Well, L1, L2 is uh, are, are the weight matrices which are trained over time. Now, you know, uh, the assumption is that the pre-trained weight W is large, while L1, L2 is pretty small. They're called as adapters, right? So it uses a small set of uh, trainable parameters L1, L2, which are called as adapters, while not updating the full parameters W, which remain fixed. Now, if you basically look at, uh, just for the sake of comparison, right, and practical understanding, if you look at uh, LAMA models, of different sizes, 7 billion parameter, 13 billion up to 65 billion parameter models, uh, 
these are sizes of uh, uh, QLoRa optimized models. OK, so this is still, uh, you know, uh, we've not talked about QLoRa in detail, but, uh, uh, you know, these are sizes of QLoRa, uh, uh, you know, um, adapted models, um, uh, um, you know, trained models. So what you observe is that uh, uh, each of these checkpoints, a large part of them is a pre-trained model, right? So essentially this is four bit pre-trained model. So 5 GB in size approximately, OK? Uh, or sorry, uh, yeah, uh, five, 5 GB and, you know, approximately 5 billion parameters also, yeah. Uh, while, as you notice, the LoRa parameters are pretty small. LoRa adapters are very small, uh, you know, 0.2% of the overall um, overall size, yeah, uh, overall pre-trained size. Uh, similarly, the other parts are the optimizer. So when you basically load this LoRa model in RAM, you basically require, uh, you know, this green part to be loaded for, for, for keeping the optimizer part up there, right? Uh, while well, you're fine tuning these models, you of course also need to store input gradient and the weight gradients. Input gradients are gradients with respect to the input embeddings, right? Um, and then weight gradients as well. Uh, so, so those are the different parts of uh, how what comprises RAM when you load these kinds of models in RAM and essentially do fine tuning. What you observe is that a large part basically is the pre-trained checkpoint. Uh, the second largest is optimizer, and then there come in these small little uh, adapters and gradients. Right? OK, so that's that. Now, uh, let me talk about gradient checkpointing. So, you know, um, when you are doing fine tuning in RAM, everything becomes very important. And therefore, people use, uh, you know, every bit of uh, memory is super important. And therefore, people use this thing called as uh, gradient checkpointing. Gradient checkpointing is a method to reduce. It's a very old method. It's not a new method. It reduces memory cost to store uh, and uh, uh, to store the intermediate feature maps and gradients during training. So while you're doing fine tuning or training, you need to store, of course, the model checkpoint, but also you need to store the feature maps, the outputs coming out from of every layer, and also the gradients while, while training. Okay. So, so for example, look at this one. So there's an input here, and when you do the forward pass, you basically uh, do several operations like full forward computation, then sigmoid computation, and then another full forward layer, then sigmoid computation, maybe compute loss, and then you start doing back propagation in the backward direction. Okay. So there's the gradient flow in that sense. Okay. So there are several optimizations that gradient checkpointing helps you to do. First is basically in-place operations. So essentially, uh, you can directly store the output values to memory of an input value. So the same color here represents the memory is reused, right? So the orange same memory can be reused for doing the sigmoid computation in-place operations themselves, right? Memory sharing, so essentially memory used by intermediate results that are no, long, no longer needed can be recycled and used in another node. For example, uh, this one can be recycled and used there. This one can be recycled and used there and so on. Right? And then further what gradient checkpointing says is that you can drop some of the intermediate results and recover them from an extra forward computation when needed. So, you know, essentially maybe you do need, you know, this result, this particular green result later. But then the idea is that after you have done some computations, you can actually delete that. And then when you actually need it right here uh, or, or later down uh, somewhere, you know, in, uh, while doing the computations, you can recompute it. You can recompute it. Uh, you, you can recompute it and then reuse it whenever you require uh, that particular, uh, when, whenever you basically require that particular result uh, in, in a backward computation. Okay. So, well, this is basically achieved by dividing the neural network into different segments and then storing only those outputs of, uh, only the outputs of those segments. For example, here there's this segment and there's this segment and you store only the outputs of those segments and actually get rid of these, uh, you know, um, when, when you're doing the forward pass. OK, so why did we discuss gradient checkpointing? Well, it's useful to actually anyway reduce the size of your, uh, you know, RAM when you're doing fine tuning. OK, the fourth preliminary point that I want to discuss is B float format. So remember, there are various uh, floating point formats. There's the standard 32-bit uh, IEEE, uh, you know, single precision uh, float format, which, which basically consists of one signed bit and then eight exponent bits and the remaining 23 fraction bits. Now, um, now, essentially, there is a, this uh, um, IEEE standard half precision format or the 16-bit fo float format, which basically has one signed bit and just five exponent bits and 10 uh, fraction bits. However, uh, you know, for neural network kind of computations, you really do not want that kind of a usage of exponent and fraction bits. And therefore, people have also proposed something called the B-float 16 format, which is actually pretty popular. Uh, it, it contains one sign bit, but then eight exponent bits and seven fraction bits. You do really do not need too much of precision, and therefore seven fraction bits are more than enough. Okay. So with that, now let's talk about what is what is uh, what is QLoRa, right? So essentially, 
um uh, 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 so it involves a regular 16 bit so so well it's basically a faster way of doing fine tuning the problem uh, why Qlora exists is because of this. Regular 16-bit fine-tuning of Llama 65 billion model requires 780 GB plus of GPU RAM, right? GPU memory. Now that's not something that everybody has, and therefore you need efficient fine-tuning approaches that re reduce the memory usage, and that is where Qlora fits in. Uh, it is useful to fine-tune a 65 billion parameter model on one 48 GB GPU while preserving full 16-bit fine-tuning task performance. So the nice part is, part is that uh, um, you know, somehow magically, you can actually reduce the GPU usage that is required uh, while retaining your 16-bit fine-tuning performance. Okay, uh, and the way it does that is by basically uh, you know uh, backpropagating backpropagating gradients through a frozen 4-bit quantized pre-trained language model using into LoRa. So essentially, it uses the same. It uses a combination of quantization and LoRa, and hence called as QLoRa. Uh, like in QLORA, it also has a pre-trained checkpoint which is, does not update, and that one it basically stores in a 4-bit format, uh, while it basically backpropagates uh, uh, gradients in a 16-bit kind of a way um, through the through the LoRa adapters. So as you see here, if you were doing full uh, uh, fine-tuning, there are no adapters here. They basically, the model requires as RAM, you know, the base model, 16-bit model, and optimizer state, which is maintained typically in 32 bits. Yeah, LoRa basically said that yes, you can actually maintain your optimizer states, but then remember you need adapters. So you need adapters, and then your pre-trained checkpoint, 16-bit uh, transformer checkpoint, which is not basically updated, right? Which is kept constant. QLORA basically says uh, that yes, you will first have not 16-bit transformer, but uh, you know a 4-bit transformer. So essentially, your pre-trained checkpoint is way smaller in size, right? Um, and then you will also have adapters, uh, and uh, so that's that's good. But then on, besides adapters, you'll also have a paged optimizer. Your optimizer is going to be split and then paged in the sense is that uh, uh, you can just like uh, you know uh, you can do. Um, uh, CPU to uh, memory, CPU to RAM kind of a paging, uh, 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 rather, you know, uh, RAM to disk kind of paging, you can actually do GPU to CPU kind of paging as well. And we'll talk about details of these three things that Qlora has, um, you know, 4-bit normal float in NF4 quantization, as it says, you know, 4-bit NF4 normal float quantization. This involves a new data type called as normal float, which I'll talk about. And then it also involves double quantization. So, you know, it just doesn't use quantization. It uses something called as double quantization that we'll talk about. And then uh, finally, it uses this third thing called as paged optimizers for its op for, for the optimizer, right? For paging for the optimizer, uh, which makes it really efficient. Okay. So let's talk details about what is QLORA and what are the three what you know details of these three parts of QLORA fine tuning. Um, 4-bit normal float quantization. So the idea is that the pre-trained checkpoint is stored as a 4-bit uh, checkpoint uh, using the NF4 data type. The NF4 data type basically uses quantile quantization uh, that ensures each quantization bin has an equal number of values assigned from the input tensor. So you know, the way this differs as follows, uh, you know, think of it like uh, creating a histogram out of some data. So typically when you draw histograms, you basically make equal width histograms, right? So if I gave you, you know, uh, some data and I told you to create histogram uh, with, uh, you know, 16 different uh, buckets, you would basically not, you, you, the way you would do that is to take your entire range max and min and then assign, uh, you know, um, values, uh, 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 basically create 16 bins of equal width and then assign values to them, which basically means some bins could be uh, rather very full, some bins could be rather empty sometimes, yeah? yeah? So, uh, but then when doing quantization, this kind of uh, uniform quantization is not a great approach. What typically helps is to do quantile quantization or also called as non-uniform quantization, non-uniform discretization, which basically means rather than bothering about equal width histograms, you actually bother about equal frequency histograms, yeah? So, so that's such that each quantization bit has an equal number of values and that leads to lowest quantization error in that sense, it's much lower compared to uniform quantization. Now, uh, since uh, uh, since uh, uh, neural network weights are uh, um, uh, spread across, um, you know, trained on uh, for a trained model, they're spread across using a, a via normal distribution. You know, uh, these guys propose NF4 quantization, NF4 data type, where the values are basically these. Uh, they are from minus one to one, and then essentially each bin basically is represented using those use those those bin centers in some ways. Now, using this this kind of a uh, distribution of your quantiles, you can actually quantize an input tensor. Uh, first, when input tensor comes in, you quantize it in the range minus one to one by doing uh, absolute max scaling, and then you do the usual quantization, considering these as your quantization centers. Okay. 
Now, uh, uh, so that's about four bit uh, four bit quantization, okay? normal flow four bit quantization. Now, what is double quantization? So now remember, when you're doing this absolute max scaling, uh, if you do typical quantization, you just have you, you have an input vector input tensor X. You have basically you know computed the absolute max value and you divide by that, and that's your quantization constant. So you have one quantization constant. But remember, in the earlier part of the video, I told about uh, uh, this blockwise quantization. Now, while doing blockwise quantization, if you basically, you know, you need to basically remember store uh, one quantization constant per block. Small block sizes are needed for precise four bit quantization. So, therefore, you would probably prefer blocks of size, let's say 64. However, small block sizes could actually lead to significant memory overhead because you need to store this quantization constant per block. So, 32 bit constants, you know, basically, uh, basically mean that for every 64 number, 64 weights, you're actually storing 32 uh, bits, basically 0.5 bits per parameter. Now, that's a big, big wastage. So, can you avoid that? That is where DQ or the dynamic uh, or the double quantization plays a role. It saves memory by quantizing these const quantization constants. Okay, so DQ uh, essentially treats the quantization constants, 32-bit uh, quantization constants of the first quantization as inputs to a second quantization. So, so imagine if you had an input tensor X, you basically uh, um, uh, divide it into two blocks of 64 each. So for each of them, you have a 32-bit quantization constant. Now you take all of those 32-bit quantization constants across the entire input tensor X, and you perform second level of quantization on top of that. This second level of quantization yields quantized const quantization constants, uh, basically 8-bit quantized constants. And uh, then you essentially have, uh, uh, you know, uh, the second level of quantization constant, just one constant which you store, which is basically uh, a 32-bit uh, uh, floating point number by itself. So these eight eight bit floats basically. Uh, so here you have you use uh, eight bit floats for the second level quantization, and you basically do it with a block size of two fifty six. So you won't basically have a single second level quantization constant for the entire entire input tensor X, but well you will have one for every block of two fifty six. Now, if you basically gotten me so far, you can actually also do this nice computation that for a block size of sixty four and a second level block size of two fifty six. This quantization, uh, you know, sort of reduces the memory footprint uh, from 32 by 32 uh, for you know for every 64 32 bits per 64 parameters to actually eight bits for every 64 parameters because that's how you're storing it, right? I mean, you're basically storing an eight bit number, eight bit quantization constant, right? Plus 32 for every uh, 256 second level blocks, which is basically 256 into 64. So that's basically 0.127 bits per parameter, bits per parameter, which is uh, significantly smaller than 0.5 bits per parameter. So that's basically second level or double quantization. Okay. Now, paste optimizers, yeah. The problem is that gradient checkpointing essentially gets into huge memory spikes, uh, you know, and these memory spikes occur when processing a mini batch with some long sequence length. Sometimes, you know, these mini batches could be could have longer sequence lengths, and for them, you know, your gradient checkpointing can have memory spikes. Now, uh, some several times, what uh, the way people solve this problem is to have a smaller overall batch size, or essentially uh, by uh, or essentially this leads to uh, you know a GPU out of memory errors, right? The, they use page optimizers to avoid exactly this problem. Uh, so automatic page-to-page -page transfers between the CPU and the GPU for error-free GPU processing in the scenario when GPU goes OOM. Yeah, it works like regular uh, memory paging that occurs between the CPU RAM and the disk, and it is used to allocate page memory for the optimizer states. Okay. Okay. So now that you've talked about these three different important parts of QLORA fine tuning, let's basically put QLORA overall in you know um, uh, end to end. So QLORA, QLORA basically uses NF4 uh, data type uh, for for the original input tensor and FP8 for the quantization constants. Okay. Uh, it uses the block size of 64 for the original weight matrix and the block size of 256 for the quantization constants. Okay. Uh, we only compute weight gradients for the LoRa parameters, which use 16-bit uh, brain float format. Okay, so BF format, BF16. So essentially, remember, we use NF4 for storing the pre-trained checkpoint. We use FP8 for storing the quantization constants, and we use 16-bit BF4 uh, for storing uh, uh, for storing the uh, you know the the, the LoRa LoRa adapters. Okay. 
Uh, so now, of course, when by doing fine tuning, you're going to update LoRa adapters via backpropagation. But then uh, these updates also require derivative with respect to your original weight matrix, pre-trained weight matrix as well, pre-trained W. Okay. Uh, now, how do you handle that? So, uh, so to handle that, and while you when you want to sort of update your uh, LoRa uh, 16-bit BF4 weights, you actually dequantize from this storage from this NF4 uh, uh, pre-trained weight matrix. Uh, to computation data type, which is basically BF16, and then calculate this derivative in the BF16 uh, BF16 uh, uh, world, right? So essentially, the idea is that there are two worlds that are maintained while doing QLoRa uh, fine tuning. One is the uh, one is the um, uh, storage type, storage data type, which is basically NF4, and the other is the computation data type, which is basically BF16. Yeah. Uh, so all in all, this is what happens uh, when you take LoRa and try to do QLoRa, right? So you have LoRa where there is a pre-trained checkpoint and there are LoRa adapters, that's good. Uh, and all of this in LoRa basically happens in uh, typically uh, a BF16 world, yeah? But when you come to QLoRa, the way you want to do it is, of course, you want to do the overall computation in the BF16 world because your X is in BF16 world. But then you and then you know you of course want to update your parameters, adapters, um, the LoRa adapters in BF16. However, when you basically store your pre-trained checkpoint, you store it in NF4, but then you do double dequantization so as to get back your um, uh, your 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 uh, um, uh, you know um, BF16 uh, from an NF4. So uh, of course the de double dequantization has to be applied in a doubly manner. So you first use uh, uh, your uh, uh, your you, you first basically obtain your uh, uh, your uh, uh, you know um, from the quantization constant you basically obtain quantization constants per blocks and then you basically obtain uh, the overall 16-bit uh, quantized value from your W from your W. Okay. okay so how does QLoRa compare with standard fine tuning? Well, um, so uh, here are some results and then some results on the next slide as well. Uh, this is Lama 7 billion fine tuning using Alpaca data set. Okay, so as you observe, um, so the LoRa paper basically said that hey, you can actually selectively, um, you know, uh, do um, uh, do um, wait up. Uh, you, you, basically, you can selectively only have LoRa updates for feed forward or uh, attention only, and they basically said you can have you know LoRa updates only for some matrices in attention sublayer and so on. But then. Uh, what these guys observed in the Skulora paper is that at least for Lama 7 billion uh, fine tuning on Alpaca, you get really good scores only if you actually do uh, QLoRa on all of those weights rather than just doing it for FFN, uh, feed forward sublayer, or the attention sublayer. Yeah. And, uh, you know, compared to a 16 bit Alpaca, uh, the 4 bit uh, um, QLoRa actually performs reasonably well. Okay. In fact, NF4 yields better performance than FP4. So you know, here's a comparison. So um, so this is basically the mean. Uh, so this is basically, uh, yeah, um, total model bits which are shown here. And uh, what you see is that you see mean zero shot accuracy over various data sets. Okay, and this is for four bit llama. So essentially, you have a, a llama model, and uh, you can uh, quantize it using FP4 format, which is basically not really quantization aware at all. Or you can actually quantize using an NF4 format or NF4 with double quantization, right? So what you observe is that, uh, of course, NF4 with double quantization will give you the, uh, 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 you know, uh, what you what you actually observe is that compared to all of them, um, you know, you observe that the NF4 with double quantization gives you better accuracy values, right? Um, of course, four bit uh, FP4 also gives you similar sizes of the models, but then what you observe is that. Uh, uh, the uh, FP4 is the worst in terms of accuracy uh, across different model scales, across different model scales. But then, you know, the green one, the NF4 with the double quantization gives you the best results. Yeah, but best performance, best accuracy. Uh, similar thing is observed also on yet another uh, evaluation. So mean perplexity. So what you observe is that uh, NF4 plus the double quantization gives you the lowest perplexity, which basically is the best. Right. Uh, Yet another experiment was done using uh, um, using uh, uh, so as to compare um, uh, BF16 uh, uh, fine-tuned uh, Robert large model on glue data. Uh, this is accuracy reported on glue data. Uh, there is also accuracy reported for T5 models um, on supernatural instructions data using RUGEL as the matrix. Yeah. So what is observed is that uh, yes, this is the accuracy obtained using without QLoRa. So no QLoRa. So this is a standard full fine tuning. Yeah, takes forever to fine tune. Yeah, but on the other hand, and forever and basically very large, very large uh, um, RAM sizes, right? Uh, 
So what you observe here is that uh, this is uh, using, uh, so this one is using LoRa, not QLoRa, so not no quantization there, and these are QLoRa, okay? With 8-bit quantization, 4-bit quantization, and uh, uh, FP4 quantization, FP4 quantization, but then this is NF4 quantization. So, uh, so that's that's that, right? With doubly quantization as well, double quantization. So what you observe is that, uh, um, yeah, I mean that uh, uh, across all of these uh, uh, metrics, you observe that uh, many of them are very close to BF16, right? So very close to BF16. Uh, um, yeah, I mean as you essentially uh, see, I mean maybe you know the 11 billion checkpoint is uh, somewhat better, but then uh, if you look at uh, uh, QLoRa, well, QLoRa is almost always as good as the LoRa uh, AP16 format with uh, much smaller um, with much smaller RAM requirements. Yeah, that's that. Um, what you also so four bit uh, four bit QLoRa essentially matches four, 16 bit full fine tuning and also 16 bit LoRa performance. Yeah, here is another experiment. This is on MMLU, so uh, evaluation on the MMLU data set, and this is using. Uh, uh, Lama checkpoints, Lama 7 billion to Lama 65 billion checkpoints, fine tuned using Alpaca and Flans V2 data sets. Uh, Alpaca and Flans V2 data sets. Okay. So, what do you observe here? Uh, and, and then basically, this is evaluation using uh, Bfloat 16, so the standard fine tuning without any LoRa or QLoRa or whatever, right? And then you have uh, uh, Float 4, so FP4, and then you also have uh, NF4 uh, plus uh, DQ, so which is QLoRa essentially. So what you observe is QLoRa with uh, NF4 sort of replicates the performance of the 16-bit fully fine-tuned model. So if you compare these performances, it's not that bad, right? They're basically pretty similar, pretty similar in that. And then, you know, if you compare the mean, it's like 53 versus 53.1. Uh, however, NF4, uh, and, and if you if you compare NF4, so NF4, which is the third one here, is superior to FP4 in terms of quantization precision. So if you look at it really, right, I mean, 52.2 versus 53.1. So NF4 is actually doing way better than FP4, thereby justifying why a new data type format was required. So now what these guys did was to basically take QLoRa and essentially fine tune use use QLoRa to fine tune um, your Llama model using eight different uh, types of data sets. Um, uh, one of them uh, was the Open Assistant SST data one uh, SST one data set, and uh, the model that they obtained using by by fine tuning uh, Llama checkpoints using uh, OA SST one uh, are called as Guanaco checkpoints uh, using using QLoRa of course. So OA SST1 is an open assistant data set that was collected using crowdsourcing. Uh, it contains several conversations, 66, basically 60,000 conversations spanning 35 different languages with uh, 161,000 different messages. What they did so is to fine tune QLoRa is not to fine tune on the entire data set, but a very small chunk of it. They actually took only the top reply at each level in the conversation tree, and that gives them just 9,209 examples. That's it. That is all that is used so as to fine tune QLoRa, uh, fine tune uh, Lama checkpoints, so as to obtain Guanaco checkpoints. Okay. Uh, now uh, these checkpoints are basically then evaluated in various ways, which I will, uh, yeah, I will talk about them in this slide and the next. Uh, so what you see here is that uh, um, you know uh, you uh, so let me first talk about uh, an interesting evaluation protocol. So when people play chess, or for that matter, any many of those games which involve tournaments, so the idea is that uh, every player has some seed rating, and then they play with another player, and uh, you know. Uh, um, uh, let's call that rating as uh, uh, if there are two players A and B, right? Let's call their ratings. Uh, if there are some ratings, you know, let's basically consider them as a measure of the expected win rate relative to the opponent's win rate, right? So, what is their expected win rate compared to the opponent's win rate? And when a tournament is held, it contains of it consists of various matches. And after every match, uh, the ELO rating, the LO rating, is basically updated. Uh, the way it is updated is uh, uh, is proportional to the expected outcome. That is an unexpected upset sort of leads to a large change in LO rating, uh, while uh, an unexpected out uh, when an while an expected outcome leads to a small change. Okay, so if uh, basically the rating of this model is thousand, the opponent model is five hundred. You know, if the model wins, sure, I mean its uh, its rating may increase like maybe eleven hundred. But then if the five hundred model basically wins over the thousand model, if the rate change in its rating LO rating is going to be much much higher. Than, than, uh, than just 100, okay? So it's widely used in uh, chess and other games, and that's the same thing that these guys used uh, to evaluate these models. So LO rating uh, uh, was used for a tournament between models where models compete to generate the best response for a, for a prompt. Uh, 
Uh, this is judged. This is basically judged by uh, by uh, by human uh, judgments, or essentially by using GPT-4. So you basically get uh, judge, get the responses from two models. You ask GPT-4, hey, which one looks better to you? Yeah. Versus uh, you ask a uh, uh, human writer, which one looks better to you? Okay. So uh, so that's that. Now what you see here is various models: GPT-4, Guanaco 65 billion, Guanaco 33 billion, where it's trained on uh, uh, Guanaco are Llama models in some ways, basically just uh, tuned uh, on OA61. So therefore, you know there are several Guanaco checkpoints: 65 billion, 33 billion, 13 billion, and 7 billion, four of them. Yeah. So what you see is that uh, uh, if you basically evaluate on Vicuna, Vicuna benchmark or Open Assistant benchmark, uh, human raters basically found. GPT-4 is the best, and then they found Guanaco 65 billion as the second best, and then you know they found Guanaco 7 billion as the third best, and so on. Right? While uh, um, while while GPT rater uh, GPT ranking basically finds uh, GPT-4 and then Guanaco 65 billion, 33 billion in that order. If you look at the median ranking, what we find is that GPT-4 is best, of course, as expected. However, Guanaco 65 billion and 33 billion are pretty good contenders, having an expected win probability of about 30 percent, which is really good compared to other models. Uh, or, or in previous models observed so far. Now, um, how does this model perform, this Guanaco models, these, these bench of family of models perform on the Vicuna benchmark? So let's look at them uh, as evaluated using GPT-4 itself. So in this GPT-4 kind of evaluation, um, you know, given a query along with, uh, and this query comes from Vicuna benchmark clearly, right? So given a query, with chat GPT and a model's responses. So you take the chat GPT response, you take the model's response, right? And you basically give both to GPT-4. And GPT-4 is basically prompted to assign a score out of 10 to both the responses. Hey, score chat GPT's response, score the model's response. Now the model performance is then obtained as a percentage of the score that chat GPT achieved. Okay. So, so therefore, sometimes if the model performs better than chat GPT, it can actually get a score better than chat GPT, right? Better than 100%, better than 100%. GPT-4 increase, uh, uh, increasing the score of the response uh, uh, occurring. Uh, so, so you know, um, yeah. Um, so, so what happens is that uh, uh, when you ask uh, GPT-4, hey, which one is doing better, chat GPT or the model response, right? Uh, GPT-4 typically is observed to increase the score of the response occurring earlier in the prompt. So essentially, if you basically, whichever you give earlier, you know, GPT-4 somehow has an affinity to give it higher scores. And therefore, what they did was to basically um, uh, take the mean uh, over both the orders. So they basically uh, asked GPT-4, um, chat GPT, and then model response, and then model response, and chat GPT, both the orders, and then it uh, they, they were, uh, you know, then the uh, average or mean was computed over both the orders. Okay. So these are the results that, as you see them here, um, you know you see results using, uh, uh, of course, Guanaco checkpoints. So there are these. Here are these four Guanaco checkpoints, right? So the, the blocks are basically 65 billion parameters, 33 billion, 13 billion, and 7 billion parameters. So that's that. Okay. Now what you observe is that uh, uh, Guanaco checkpoints are all four bit, of course, clearly, right? You also observe comp comparison being done with Open Assistant checkpoint of 16 bit and Vicuna checkpoint of 16 bit, right? Every other four bit model are essentially Llama models, which have been tuned using these particular data sets using QLORA, right? Using QLORA. Um, now, as you observe clearly, 41 billion parameter checkpoints take a huge amount of RAM, but they are all four bit, remember? Okay. Compared to that, Open Assistant 16 bit checkpoint takes 66 GB. Of course, it will take more because it's 16 bit, clearly. Yeah. So that's that. But what you observe is the following. Uh, you know, you observe that the Guanaco uh, 65 billion, the uh, mean of this uh, uh, comparison, GPT-4 scored comparison is 99.3. So it's the best performing model after GPT-4. Of course, GPT-4 has much higher. Fine, fair enough. Yeah, it will it will surely be better than chat GPT. So that's okay. But it achieves 90, uh, you know, Guanaco 65 billion achieves 99.3% performance relative to chat GPT, which is a huge win, right? Uh, Guanaco 33 billion at 97.8% uh, is a 21 GB model, which is basically three points better than the Vicuna 30, 13 billion model uh, of, of larger RAM size, right? So essentially three points better. Okay. Now again, Guanaco 7 billion checkpoint, as you see here, uh, it's basically just 5 GB, which basically means it, it can actually fit on your phone, right? So you can do inference and fine tuning on your phone, it turns out right now. 
uh, while still scoring 12, uh, you know, about about 20 percent points higher than the uh, than the alpaca checkpoint. So if you basically uh, compare it with the uh, alpaca checkpoint, whether it is uh, a 13, uh, yeah, alpaca 13 billion checkpoint, in fact. So, you know, if you compare with the alpaca 13 billion checkpoint, you still you observe about 20 points better uh, is uh, Guanaka checkpoint is 20 points better. OK, so let me summarize this video. So what is QLoRa? It's an efficient fine tuning approach that reduces memory usage. It's a combination of quantization, quantized pre-training checkpoint uh, with uh, LoRa, with the uh, low rank adapters. Um, it basically involves three important things, four bit normal flow data type based quantization and F4 quantization, double quantization of quantization constants and paged optimizers. On Vicuna benchmark, Guanaco 65 billion uh, which is basically uh, QLoRa trained on OASST1, Open Assistant uh, uh, dataset, right? Um, Guanaco 65 billion is the best performing model after GPT-4, achieving 99.3% uh, performance relative to chat GPT, while it requires only 24 hours of fine tuning on a single GPU. When compared to GPT-4, Guanaco 65 billion and 33 billion have an expected win probability of 30% uh, as, as, as computed using the LO ratings, right? Uh, QLoRa, uh, in some ways, as we have discussed in this video, can be seen as an equalizing factor that helps to close the resource gap between large corporations who have, you know, insanely large compute power to fine tune these models versus small teams which don't have them and just have have consumer GPUs. While the seven billion checkpoints uh, were shown to be able to run on phones before, you know, you could run them. QLoRa is the first method that could sort of enable fine tuning these checkpoints on 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 mobile phones. Yeah. Uh, as part of this paper, uh, the authors also released uh, all their uh, QLoRa fine-tuned checkpoints uh, across eight different data sets uh, of four different sizes. So therefore, these 32 checkpoints, they're available on Hugging Face, um, and uh, they're also available on this GitHub page along with the, uh, the open-sourced code and the CUDA kernels. Uh, here is also a good demo of one of those 32 different uh, checkpoint models, which you could enjoy when you have time. Hope you liked the video. Thank you for watching. Connect with me on my LinkedIn or look at my research on my homepage. Thank you.